Welcome to the Minnesota Coach Call, the third one. This one is kind of a, an open um, discussion. I've got a few things that I will go through, and I do have some um, questions that have already been submitted. So we will answer those and then get to your questions as well. So that didn't change. Hang on. All right. We have to do it that way. All right. So we'll kind of cover the judging structure one more time, just kind of as a reminder. Core values um, is no longer a separate judging session. That will be core values will actually be judged both during the project um, presentation and during the robot design session. The core values are embedded in all the new rubrics, but there will be a core values judge in both the project session and in the robot design session. Um, the judging sessions will be 15 minutes allocated for each. So both innovation project will have 15 minutes, robot design slash programming will have 15 minutes. Um, each of those will begin with a five minute presentation in project the kids have to do, the five minute presentation in the robot design slash programming. They don't have to, but it is really a good recommendation that the kids um, to just make sure they're getting their information out there. And then there will be 10 minutes of question and answer that will follow. Big change to our judging structure this year. The programming judging is going to be judged by only one judge. The design judge will judge both design and programming. Um, so there will be one judge mainly talking to the kids about that. And again, there will be a core values judge during, in, during the design and programming that is more of a observational judge. The Minnesota Programming Award will still be presented. So we wanna make sure the kids are talking about their programming. And as a reminder, it's a 15 minutes session. If the kids have that presentation, the judges will ask them that. Do you have a five minute presentation? We want them to prepare that if possible so that they can kind of present their best um, parts of it. And then 10 minutes of Q and A with the judges following that. We want to really encourage the, judge, the kids to discuss their engineering process in both design and programming, how they got there um, with their design and how that affected their programming and vice versa, how the process they went through affected their programming and their design. So it'll be a little bit different that they'll only see that one judge. And this is a change from what we told you initially. Um, but if you look at the robot design, rubric, really go through it, you'll see that the rubric is asking questions both about coding and about building. So the robot design is not, the robot design judging is not just about building your robot. It's about the design process of both the robot build, the strategy, and the programming, and still the communication between the kids. Um, the big question as to why we are changing this. Uh, there's two parts. It aligns uh, more directly with the first judging standards. Minnesota has had a separate uh, programming judge forever, and we have our own award. And this is something that is different than what a lot of other partners do. Minnesota, we were able to do this for a long time. And unfortunately, it's really a lot of this is due to lack of volunteers. Uh, we are really struggling to get those technical judges. So if you uh, are interested in this, you're concerned about this, um, we say that all the time, and I can't stress enough, uh, coaches, you make great judges. And if you really want to see that secret sauce behind um, the windows, behind the uh, scenes, we really encourage you to volunteer. We'll talk about some robot game updates. This one just came out um, October 21st. The update is the sorting center setup adjustment. So instead of the sorting center being set up by the referees in a random pattern, the team can actually rec uh, ask for a certain setup with the sorting center. There are six configurations, so they can't ask for the orange um, container to be put on the top row. That is always going to be for the green container. The orange container will always be on the middle shelf. The blue, the, 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 oh, the blue container is always on the bottom shelf, but they can ask 
for the orange um, container to be in the first bay. The actual update, oh, I think we need someone to mute there. A little, there we go. Um, and we, they are asked that they set up a different configuration each time they come to the table. So they request from the ref how they want it. And then the next time they come to the table, it should be a different setup. And then the third time they come to the table, it should be a different setup. The practice, you can do whatever way you want because that does not count for points. So if you want to practice it one way and that's the way you set up for your first round, that's okay. But your other three, your three official rounds, have to have different setups if you are setting up the sorting center. And then these are just the quick updates that were from, in case you missed the last update, um, the airdrop sharing adjustment. We are working on the schedules and I will talk about that on a later slide. Um, there will be some teams that will be in person. They will be at the hybrid events in person and there may not be a team on the table across from them just because we have some uneven numbers at some of our tournaments. Um, so this airdrop sharing adjustment will come into play. So if you are wanting, if you do the helicopter mission, the one at the, the far end, make sure that the airdrop from your posing table is set down for you. And our refs will be working on that and talking to the kids about it, but we will see that situation pop up that um, teams may run at the hybrid without a team across from them. And then update nine, the cargo plane clarification. I really wanna stress that in Minnesota tournaments, we will be working with our cargo planes to make sure that they are all the way up, that that yellow bar is all the way up. We will not have any that are drooping. So if your plane is, your cargo plane door is drooping, make sure you are practicing with all the way up. I hear I've got a question. Mm -hmm. I think for the the um, the sorting center, just ask the ref. You don't have to draw anything out. You don't have to have anything fancy. Just say we would like the orange in the first bay, blue in the second bay, green in the third bay, and then the ref will set that up. Um, again, because the orange is always going on the center shelf, the blue is always on the lower shelf, and the green is always. So you can tell them where you would like that. Mainly it's the orange one, obviously, that we're concerned about it. But just go ahead and tell the ref. And once the ref has said it, it's the team's job to look at it and make sure it's the way they want it to be. All right. And then update number eight, just a reminder, you may not remove that food package from the helicopter. That food, kept, that, uh, food packet is dangling over your team's home area. They cannot reach over and grab that. Their robot cannot reach over and grab it, that is their opponent's team, um, uh, their opponent's package, and that will be um, interference, except for if they don't have a team running across from them, and probably the referee will be the one that will take it off of the helicopter and set it into place. Um, this is kind of exciting, this is exciting for me. Uh, the scoring software app, this is the exact same one that our referees will be using. Um, because at the tournaments, there will be no paper. We are going to be scoring, live scoring with our referees, and they have a tablet that they will use, and then we'll go through. Teams can practice with this. It's on our website, and I'm going to just show you a quick image of what it looks like. So this is what it will look like on the tablet. The referee will just march down the scoring software and saying yes, no, yes, no. You'll notice over here, no points are adding up. The referees don't need know the points. They don't care about the points. The referee's job is to walk down and just say, yes, you did this. Nope, you didn't do that. Yes, you did that. And they will walk through it and you will see that it highlights green. And then over here in this column, you will see yeses and nos um, going at being added up. So partlys, completelys, uh, there's a scanner up scroll bar here that shows them if they've done one or two. And what I really want the teams to practice with and know about is if they're doing the cargo connect where they're pushing containers, they will, as they start filling this out, get a big red warning sign. And that's okay. What our refs are going to do is they're going to go through mission 16. They'll kind of go around the table and they'll go around five times. 
So the first thing our refs will do is count how many containers are partly in any circle. Then they will count how many containers are completely in a circle. And that is always going to throw up one, this red warning. And that's okay. And then what our refs will do is they'll go look in the blue circle and see if the blue container is completely in. Well, that's even more warnings. Then they'll look at the lime green circle and say yes or no. And then they will count number of circles with at least one container completely in. And based on what they have said in the previous questions, that is where they're going to say, oh, okay, now my warnings have gone away. So have your kids practice that so they kind of know what that looks like. And then down here um, with the referees, the kids will be looking at this and they'll say, yep, we agree with the score entry. And actually, I think it, it's a different word um, on our tablets. And it will say um, the team agrees with what has been entered above. And the team is not going to touch this button. The ref will touch the button. But once the ref clicks that, uh, it, it will give them a question. Then the ref will say, do you want to submit? The ref will submit it. And then that score will appear on the scoreboard. So I would love you to practice this, test this out. And this lives on our website. And I will show you where. So that is on our website under Cargo Connect under the judging and rubrics and the Minnesota score entry app. It doesn't keep track of the score, doesn't keep track of the points, but it does, it will give them, so they're used to seeing what the refs are, <clears throat> excuse me, going to see. And I've got some questions. So Jeannie, there was a question already about the configuration of that orange, green and piece. How do they ask the refs, refs for that? Do they just talk to the refs? Do they have to provide a written thing to the ref? How do they tell okay. the refs? Okay, the I, did, I did answer that. So what, what they should just do is they'll just say to the ref, we would like the orange in the first bay, blue in the second bay, green in the third bay, however they want it. And the ref is going to line that up because the orange is always on the middle shelf. Blue is always on the bottom shelf. And then it's up to the team to look over there and say, yep, that is how we want it set up. So they ask the ref, they're not going to submit a piece of paper. We're not going to do a big formal presentation on this, but uh, the kids should just ask. And then after the ref does it, it's up to the kids to look at it and say, yes, that looks correct to us. Or no, oh, we meant, you know, orange in the center bay. So talking about which bay they want, each color should do it. Okay. Any other questions? Is the chicken always on the mission board or is it only for moving the turbine blade? The chicken starts on the, on the board. So if you look at your mission setups, um, the, the chicken, it's, um, it's on, on the board set mission setups, I think it is. And the chicken starts there and stays there until the team moves it. And I will go to open questions in, in just a minute. I've got a couple more things I want to get to. Okay. I can't hear Cheryl. Okay, I'll look at it. Um, is there about um, different core values judge? One in each judging room. Yes, there will be two judges, one in each judging room. Um, there are some required forms that need to be filled out. This is new um, this year that we have to get uh, consent and release from all of our participants. I know that first has you fill that out on your dashboard, but we do not get that information. And actually that consent and release only covers first. It does not cover high tech kids. So on our website, we're asking that every team member and every coach and mentor fills out a consent and release form. These are now open. These were not open until uh, we opened them October 25th. Um, Here's a tip, and I will actually show the form where it is on our website. We've got it right at the top, so it's very easy for your parents to get to. They just click on this consent and release. They don't have to log in. They don't have to do anything. They'll read all this, hopefully, and they'll scroll down, enter that participant's name, parent's name, and then the important thing is they enter their program, their Lego League challenge, their team number, okay, and then type this in. 
And then it says, would you like a confirmation email? This is a tip we got from another coach is they said, click that yes, and then enter the coach's email in this participant email. And then it, the, then the coach will get that email that says, hey, Jeannie has filled out her consent and release form. And then you don't have to keep tracking it down. But really important that they get that team number on there too. Pardon? <laughs> do you still need to do the first form? <laughs> um, the first form doesn't cover us. Um, I know it's a lot of work to get those filled out. I know that there is a song and dance involved in that. Um, if you can get your parents to do it, do it. Um, we absolutely need it here in Minnesota. So we are going to be hardcore about it. We are going to chase you down for those. Um, it's it's painless though, right? It, it, it's pretty painless. Like I showed Ours. you, it's, they don't have to fill out. They don't have to log in. They don't have to remember password. They just have to go to that front um, button there and, and get logged in. If they cannot do that, you can bring a paper form. And the paper form is available to you on our um, required forms field um, form uh, site page, something like that. And that lives <laughs> and that lives right here under required forms. And that is also where the demographic that we're going to ask each team to fill out. Um, this is a coach fills this out. And this is where you're letting us know um, some information. This is something that our funders ask us. Um, this is how they help off. This helps us offset the cost of a lot of our expenses. Um, Cheryl, do you want to say something on that real quick? The About percentage. the research work? The research um, no, work? No, nope. the, the demographics, why we collect those. Oh, so um, our, your um, fees that you guys pay, the tournament fees, um, cover about 30% of the cost of our tournaments, and the other 70% is covered by our generous donors. And so um, if I don't have demographics, then they don't know who we serve and we won't be able to get funding. So um, it really helps us get keep our fees as low as possible. So really appreciate you making your best guess. I, I don't expect you to interview parents, just make a guess and that's good enough for us. Um, we just have to have some data to share with them. Um, so we appreciate you guys all doing that. I'm sorry. I was answering another question on the chat. That's okay. Um, Chris, that's a great point. And actually, I think I could probably, Chris is asking for a separate confirmation email address. And I bet I could do that quickly. <laughs> I'll see if I can do that quickly. I think I can. Um, so we can do that. So um, we can get that there. And then if a parent is a second adult in the pits, yes. Anyone that is um, basically moving those kids around, we would want a consent and release form from them. Okay. And next, so tournament schedules. We're getting this email a lot, a lot, a lot. I know that. Um, the November schedules will be posted by the end of this week. I am cranking through those right now. Egan is actually posted. Prior Lake Saturday is completed. It's just not posted yet. Um, and then the other part, the second prior lake will be posted by Friday. The December tournaments will be posted by the end of next week. So if you're waiting on those, um, please be patient. We're getting them out as quickly as we can. And then the tournament pages are being generated. So uh, we are putting those out again as we get the information and as we get those. And those are again on our website under tournament schedules. And we have some upcoming coach meeting slash calls. We obviously are not going to have an opening ceremonies this year because all of the teams are not in place at one time. So uh, the week, um, a, a couple a week before, or a couple weeks before, we will have calls that will be specific to tournaments. So the November tournaments, there will be a coach call on Tuesday, November 9th. And Vicki will send out the information with this, with the details on this and the Zoom link. Our head judge and a head ref will be on those calls as well to answer any of your last minute questions. We will talk about specifics about the locations, um, any changes that may have come about with the schedule or anything like that. The December tournaments, your phone call will be 
um, November 30th, Greater Minnesota tournaments. We'll cover both of those tournaments in one call, and that will be December 7th. And then remote tournaments, there will actually be a couple different activities for the remote tournaments starting. Um, actually, next week, we will do a Discord practice, and that email blast is in the works um, to get that to you. Uh, I think tomorrow is when that one is scheduled to go. So if you're in a remote tournament, more information on that and how that works is coming your way. And that was a lot of information I know to throw at you. Um, I've got a couple questions here. Um, um, Jeannie, we, we will, have a question. question yep, for the we, we will be recording those tournament calls. And then the links for those will be on specifically on your tournament pages. And let me just show a tournament page real, really quickly. So it's on our website um, under the programs and our tournament schedule. And I'll show you Egan's page because that one's done. So the Egan page, so over here on the right hand side is where the list um, the list will be, and it, there will be a link here for your phone call. And then once that phone call is done, give us about a day, and then we will have a link to the recording. So Hermantown in December is Greater Minnesota. So Alexandria and Hermantown are our Greater Minnesota tournaments. Um, someone, so then I have a couple of robot questions, and let's do some specific things here. If anyone has any, a specific question, you put in Q&A or you're welcome to unmute and ask a question if you need to. Okay, so I'll go through a couple of these questions that I had. Um, does the robot attachment still need to return completely into home before, and pick, before being picked up? Um, the robot has to come into home and that is where the kids can interact with the robot and change things or set things up without receiving a loss of a precision token. They can interrupt their robot out on the field. That's fine, but they will lose a precision token if they do that. And then you just wanna make sure if they're going to interrupt that robot when it's out on the field, that they understand the rules of interruption um, with, with cargo and without cargo. And if you're not sure on that, I would go back to our video and watch that because that's important that they know what happens if they interrupt the robot when it's out on the field and it's still touching cargo. All right. Um, someone asked about rule 11, talks about field checks between the inspection and the first launch. First launch is when we go three, two, one, Lego. And when the rep says, L the MC says L of Lego, the kids can push the button and the robot can go. Um, and then the robot comes back into launch, comes back into home, the kids may reset it, they may change an attachment, they may put another piece of cargo in front of it, and then they'll push go and the robot will go out again. Um, someone says, if we find something in the code needs to be changed, you're not going to have a lot of time to change that. I'm going to be quite honest with this condensed schedule of two hours. Um, there is not going to be a lot of time for the kids to do a lot of changing because they are going to have two judging sessions in that time, a practice round and three official robot rounds. So um, if they need to do a lot of changing of code, that is going to be quick and challenging. But uh, excuse me, I think that's the question I asked. This is Diane. Hi, and, Diane. And um, between the practice, if on the practice round, we may find something somewhat si uh, simple like uh, we have an adjustment for turns sure, and, sure. and if on that table is different from our mat, which we don't have an official table, we might need to change that adjustment like from one or to two degrees. So that's where I was thinking we might need a change um, in the code. Yep, you might, and you're welcome to do that. We will also have practice tables set up so the first thing my teams always did is we would go do one practice round and see if <laughs> any of the wheels fell off or anything got <laughs> loose in transit. So you'll definitely wanna um, go to the practice table and at least get one 
um, you, the, the practice tables, which are kind of off to the sides in the pits. And then Deanna, you get one practice round with the referee and that does not count for points. That is just practice. So they will have some opportunity. It's just not a lot of opportunity to change code. Oh, okay. So we have, how, how much time do we have on the practice tables that are around the side? I didn't as much, um, it depends on how many other people need to get on the practice table. We, okay. you know, you'll have to share and use gracious professionalism, but we will generally, um, depending which tournament you're in, there aren't as many teams in, but we try and allocate enough so that no one has to be waiting or certainly not waiting a long time for a practice table. Uh, and then that, that actually helps me with another question. Someone asked, do you have to bring your practice tables? You do not have to bring your tables. We will have performance tables set up, the game tables, and we will have practice tables set up. We do ask that if you want to, we ask that someone brings a, a mat and sets that out and any dual lock pieces because we don't have enough to do that. Um, and then we will... Um, and we just ask that you put those things that are dual locked. And if you're practicing with containers, bring your own containers to the table, that practice table, not the performance table, but the practice table. And put your team number on everything you have. We go home with a lot of extra Lego at the end of tournaments that, that get left behind. So put your team numbers on everything you can. Okay, so let, let me just clarify. You have practice tables, but they don't have mats on. Is that what you're saying? Well, we hope that, that someone will set their practice, one of the team members will set theirs up. Uh, that could be you. It might be someone else. But high tech is, we just don't have enough sets to do that. But okay. generally, it has not been a problem. We, we, it seems like every time someone, usually some of our more experienced teams are the ones that are willing to put theirs out there. Okay, thanks. That helps. You're welcome. No problem. Um, then I see a question. Yes, the email judging sheets, so the rubrics, once they're filled out, we will be emailing those out early the week after your tournament, generally Monday or Tuesday. I'm not going to promise Monday. I would love to promise Monday, um, but you will have them by Tuesday, and they will be emailed to the coach the, uh, that we have on file. The demographic form that we ask you to fill out we do ask for an address on there, and that is the mailing address. So if you win a trophy, woohoo, we will mail that out to you. And that is going to be mailed at whatever address we get on that demographic form. So that'll take a couple more days. And then the kids will get their medals when they check in. And that will also be based on the demographics that you have provided. All right, I'm looking at my questions. I think these are all answered. All right. Oh, Wilbert had one. So I've got another one, and I think I talked about it here. The judging sessions are 15 minutes long, so five-minute presentation from the kids and 10-minute Q&A. If the kids don't have a presentation in the design, robot design, the, the judges will just start asking questions. Okay, this is Diane again. I have another one. Maybe you didn't understand my question. Okay. I know how things start at the first launch. There's the three, two, one, or whatever. Yep. But, that, but then one of the rules, and unfortunately I'm not at home, so I don't have my book with me, but I think one of the rules said that um, uh, for subsequent launches, they have to make sure the judge that they, they've covered these two things, okay? Yep. That they're not touching it and stuff. How... How do we get the confirmation from the judge that it's okay to go? It, mainly the referee is standing there. So if it looks like the kids are getting ready to, to go out again, to launch again, the refs are watching them. They'll be kind of looking and saying, oh, that's not quite in. And they may check it real quick. But the refs will be watching. So it'll be pretty clear um, that the, the kids are, their robots going to go out again. And the refs will be watching. They'll kind of be keeping an eye out and saying, okay, yep, you look good. Okay, so we don't have to ask them. No, you're not going to ask the ref, are we good? You know, yeah. and that is, and that's why we have that practice round. That has been such a great addition because it, it gets the kids comfortable and they kind of know what to expect. So that practice round will be great for that. Okay, well, I wanted to practice with the kids too. So that's, we're all yep. new on this. So. Yep, yep, I hear you. Yep, all and right. if you, and if you have other questions, feel free to email me 
or even call us in the office too. Okay. You can help with that. Well, Jean, right. Jeannie, yeah. for the, uh, for the uh, project, normally you have to make two presentations to two outside organizations before. Is that still true with all the COVID issues that we, that we have to do that? Um, actually, if you look at the rubrics for um, the project, it really just talks about have you presented your information to an outside source or a professional or maybe not even an outside source? And then have you taken that feedback and iterated with that information um, it, for the top um, for to be considered exceeds you would probably be presenting to more than one person but you know some of my kids my teams we never presented if this is pre-covid we never went to people we did a lot of things actually virtually um, so look at that rubric and see what the requirement is there isn't a requirement to present to two groups the requirement the the different levels are, did you share with anybody? Did you share with professionals? And, and, and again, it's about that process and it's about that iteration. Did you take that feedback you got and change something or improve something or maybe not improve anything because you, they said, Hey, you, you did a great job. These rubrics are posted on the website. The rubrics are, are on our website. Absolutely. And I can, they are under, um, the challenge under resources, uh, I'm sorry, under the Cargo Connect, judging and rubrics, and they're all listed right there. And you can click on those and go through those with them. Let's see, we've got a comment from a coach, and she said, lately we've had a lot of groups of students needing to quarantine Do in the worst case scenario, of one of our teams all being in quarantine. Is there a contingency plan? Um, I guess our contingency would be to move you to a remote to the remote event in December. I think that's one that we have a little flexibility with. So if you've got that going on, please contact us and we will do our best to figure out what we can do for your team. Okay. Did they miss any questions there? All right. We don't want to keep you too long if you guys don't have any additional questions. Um, I did throw up in the chat the link to the research workshop. So um, oh. some of you guys were on the, the call, but Jeannie put that up on our website too. So you can find it under um, training and workshops. And like you go to the link as if you were going to go to sign up for it. And there's a YouTube link there that you can watch the research workshop. So if your team doesn't have a project, this might spur some ideas. Um, we thought the, the the presentation was really interesting, especially how they move a wind turbine from a ship in Duluth through a roundabout. It was pretty fascinating. So, um, and one of our other coaches that works for Amazon um, shared a lot about logistics. So, if you, if your team needs some inspiration, that might be a an hour well spent. And um, we'll keep that link up there for for the season. Yeah, I agree. I I thought that was a fascinating research workshop. I had a question about the uh, unused capacity mission. Okay. Um, so it starts out on the board, so they can just push it off the board into the into the, the home area and load it by hand, and then that gives 30 points? Yep. Okay. And then if they choose to use that and set it back on the board, then then you get extra points for using it as cargo. Yep, they can use that as one of the containers going out for the, the Cargo Connect. And that's kind of where you get that little, ooh, you know, because if they tip it over accidentally, then, they're you know, points are scored at the end. So mm -hmm. even though they filled it, if it accidentally tips over, that's not going to count. So you got to kind of go, okay, are we are we steady enough that we feel confident of sending that out? But otherwise, yeah, bring that into home, fill it up. The kids are filling that up by hand. The robot is not filling that up. And then it doesn't have to go anywhere if you don't want it to. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You bet. All right. Anything else? I think I got them all. If you come up with any other questions, please contact us. Um, you can send me emails, genie at hightechkids.org. I guess I've never even introduced myself, but um, genie at hightechkids.org. Send me questions or comments and we'll 
try and help you out with that. And then Vicki will be sending out, an, <clears throat> excuse me, tournament specific information with those coach calls. We really recommend that at least one coach is on those calls because you'll hear any last minute details about your specific events in November, December, and then the, the outstate and the, the remote ones. So if we don't have any other questions, I am willing to wrap up early. And there we've got a good luck coaches. And uh, again, we thank you all for um, coaching the kids. This is such a great program and, but we cannot do it without the coaches. So we so, show, so appreciate you and shameful plug. Don't forget, you can always volunteer too. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much.